this is the worst allergy season ever. <laughs> People that never had them, have them. People that had them, have them worse. People that had them worse are heavily medicated. <laughs> and now, your regional forecast. A mood swing advisory is in effect following a surge of unpleasant airborne pathogens. Hypersensitive people are advised, stay indoors indefinitely. Spring is my worst season. Pollen is everywhere, turning me into an unshaven, ghoulish ogre. Everything is too bright, too loud, and more irritating than usual. <coughs> Summer, actually my worst season. You see a beautiful summer rain. I see an army of airborne mold spores on the attack. These microscopic parasitic fungi are armed and dangerous. Autumn, truly my worst season. Sleepy head, watery itchy eyes, and I always look stoned. Ragweed has waged war and is winning. This lowly contemptible weed commands respect. Winter. Truly my worst season. Musty heat vents, fireplaces, wood stoves, and dust mites living in everyone's carpet, furniture, and bedding. It's enough to make you sneeze or vomit, one or the other, because you can't do both. And then there's cigars, cigarettes, pipes, cologne, perfume, mothballs, and those obnoxious auto air fresheners. The whole thing just gives me the willies. The only thing worse than allergies is the terminology. Mucus, moist, secretion, diet. Oh, the last one you know gets me every time. And now, your local forecast. A high pressure system gives way to emotional flooding in low lying areas only to return excitedly before the weekend. The views expressed in this poem are merely that of the poet and do not constitute any real medical research. For more on allergies in your life, visit us at hypersensitivity.autoimmune.breathe. Thank you. <laughs>
movable homes are replaced with square permanent residences. Wheat, beet, and apples replace the three sisters. Cows replace wild deer. Stone walls marking boundaries replace stone rows marking seasonal alignments. A matrilineal clan is replaced by patriarchy. Fiery guns replace bow and arrow. Streams now filled with mills, blocking ocean fish, returning to lay eggs. Abundant migrating birds that fill the sky become extinct. The English have arrived. Why do you lie so still on the path to the well? You know every catastrophe you're capable of creating. Do you hear every singing mother passing by on her way to the well? Her tiny baby tied on her back with a bright red sarong. <coughs> She's seen the lives you've changed forever. How does it feel to witness her terror? How is it that men at odds with other men have been using you as a weapon of war since Roman times. You have a long history and your effectiveness is proven. Your plastic coating changes color. Sometimes you stand on stilts or hang between wires or float in the water. You are so clever and so lethal, made to maim and not to kill. Sadly, your victims are the world's poorest. Who assembled you, I demand to know? Who snapped together your plastic parts after stuffing you with explosives? Who designed you to need only the tiniest tilt caused by a mother's toe? Or a boy's finger reaching for you like a toy to set you off? Who would allow this to happen to a child? Where exactly are you buried on the worn path leading to the school where flocks of children run eager to learn, dreaming of their dreams of a future? You know where you hide to kill the dreams of those children. You know where you hide and we don't. Yes, I've met you dozens of times. You were left after war was over, yet you keep on killing. If only one part of you is banned, I ask, would the carnage stop? If only one country agreed not to make and sell you for a few dollars, would it stop? Would the mothers feel safer going to the well? Would the children's dreams be more likely to come true? Luke and Lefty. Barstool savants in action. Knocking down beers while analyzing stats. It's curious, says Lefty, how in baseball, batting 300 makes you an all-star. When adding it all up, you only get three hits and make seven outs in every 10 at-bats. Also, says Luke, at the track, you can pick three winners and seven losers out of ten races and still make decent money if your winners come in at good odds. Yeah, but, says Lefty, in business, averaging three good days to seven bad days leads you into bankruptcy before you know it. Besides that, says Luke, getting it right in life three times and wrong seven times is an unmitigated jinx. Tell me about it, says Lefty. Ain't we sitting here with just ourselves and no dames? But then again, says Luke, in government, doing three things well and seven things poorly still makes you an all-star in the public's eye. Indeed, says Lefty, that's society's blind spot. Right you are, says Luke. Let's get back to baseball. <laughs> Thank you. Some say there's a season 
time for every purpose some say there's a reason all the things that hurt us well i don't know the master plan just focus on the small plant potatoes in april garlic in the fall Grown up life's a busy mix of startled stress and hurry. Sometimes I can't help myself give in to the worry. Other days I take it slow and listen to the rainfall. Plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. There's a time for doing taxes, a time for washing dishes, a time for smelling roses, a time for catching fishes, a time to read, a time to write, a time to search for answers, a time to leave your seat and join the dancers. Nightly news assails us with images of horror. Arguments on Facebook really make things clear. I'm often tempted to chuck it all and plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Some hope politicians will be the ones to save us. Others say the answer is to bow our heads to Jesus. Don't got much faith in praying, less in building walls. I plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Cause there's a time for doing taxes Time for washing dishes A time for smelling roses A time for catching fishes A time to read, a time to write A time to search for answers Time to leave your seat and join the dancers There's a meditation in working for the future. Tender shoots and seeds and hope, all things we can nurture. Each act of compassion shows we're in it for the long haul. Plant potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Potatoes in April, garlic in the fall. Thank you. There's an ocean that lives inside of me by breathless fathoms, waves wild, and sparse shallow dunes, clear as dawn. There's a calling back into the, wa- into the waters by our cleansing, freeing, weightless ways. There's a glacier that lives inside of me, cold, unyielding, ancient and raw, the pathmaker, traveler, renewer. There's a calling back for basic need as ways wandered, new valleys to seed. There's a sky that lives inside of me, sparse and wide, spectrums and shade, Thunder, clouds, rain, and blue, fiercely so as the breath of a newborn. There's a mountain that lives inside of me, her majesty's grace towering high, snowfields rock and pastures grazed. There's a calling back upon the range, the raising of self, horizons gained. 
There is a valley that lives inside of me, calm, sweet grass and meadow, the home of solace and grace, I suppose. There's a calling back into this peace where a heart torn by life shall heal. There's a galaxy that lives inside of me, sparse and wide and yet minute, a single cell perhaps, the womb of God. There's a calling I hear, a sense, a knowing, but I don't know why. Still, I shall be, I. There's a child that lives inside of me, a grand subject of innocence in life, a master, a seer, a wanderer, a freer. There's a calling, an eternal calling, and I am learning now to listen. Thank you. What I believe in is only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, a world of only love. Come and sing this happy song, happy song, happy song of a world where everybody does belong, a world of only love. Everybody, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, a world of only love. Thank you. Join hands and sing this song, sing this song, sing this song of a world where everybody does belong, a world of only love. Only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, a world of only Show the children that there's only love, only love, only love. Show the children that there's only love, a world of only love. Only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, a world of only love. It's a very very special day, special day, let's shout hooray. It's a very, very special day, a day of only love. Only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, only love, a day of only love and a world of only only love. Thank you. Only love. So we were driving in my car. Eve and I, and Eve looks out the window, and neither one of us is minding the silence that exists between us like a gentle sea, with the two of us set on separate little boats, floating, knowing that each other is nearby. Just this morning, I noticed Eve enter the room and sink deep down into the closest chair, and she called it a simple arrhythmia, but Eve needed a few moments to revive and synchronize her heart's pumping and her labored breathing. And when Eve recovered, she charged forward to read her poetry to an audience whose heart and breath were all quite regular, perhaps not having the same kind of mourning, the same kind of living of life. And she got to them with all her words like a hungry, gentle fist, picking each up by the scruff of their neck, gently shaking them until they were breathing just as hard. After the reading, I am driving my 83-year-old friend Eve back to her car. And so we share this ride and talk about the obligatory for a bit work, families, destinations ahead, and then we head for the deeper matters, places we both have always dared to go. How it feels to be me not knowing what I should be doing with my life at this time, the children growing, moving onward, 
considering ways I have changed. I tell her of how hard it is to raise daughters I love so much and think about setting them loose into the world, which I have grown to both fear and love. She tells me how her daughter that she cared for so many years is now going with her to the doctor appointments, calling her to see how she is doing every day. Is she taking all her medication? And how that's sometimes all too hard to fathom. I tell her I feel my body is shifting like the Earth's plates and that my womb is telling me it's time to say goodbye and how it is so mildly shocking, like a little earthquake. She listens and nods and says she remembers how it is and looks out the window and quietly murmurs that she remembers like she remembers her first day of becoming a woman, like she remembers her first day of school and how it all passes by so fast and huge in the blink of an eye. And she mentions that being 83, she sometimes wonders what it'll be like when she's gone. For those she loves, will they keep her close in her mind, in their mind? Will they be all right? Who will look after them the same way she does? What will it be like to struggle to breathe? To feel your organs shutting down one by one, quietly turning out the lights and performing those last few movements like a slow dance without a partner and whisper the little delusions of your mind before the switches all go black and out. What will it be like to finally close your eyes and say goodnight? And we both don't know what to say then and at that point, so I look ahead while I drive, and Eve looks out the window. It's a silence that is suitable. And we both feel the depth of our exchange, and we embrace the silence about us, the sea that has us floating in our separate little boats but throwing anchors out to each other. <coughs> And suddenly Eve inhales, like this, <gasps> such a high-pitched shriek, I'm sure her heart or her last breath being released that she might have known it was coming. And so I pull the car over to look at her, although I don't want to face what truth might exist. But as I do, I turn to see her, and Eve is just sitting there, and she's smiling, so at peace, looking out the window, breathing just fine, while she points and exclaims. Would you look at those gorgeous blossoms on that magnolia tree? <laughs> and I sigh a breath of relief and compose myself and turn my neck to look at her out Ruth's window, Eve's window for a moment or so, and she's right. It's breathtakingly gorgeous. So we both are looking and celebrating with our common stare of wonder, looking at this tree like a brilliant pink and red sunset of, on the sea in this moment. We can feel the calm promise of life's beauty, of how in this life it's all meant to be unpredictable, mysterious, painful, beautiful. And we sit for a few more moments in admiration of this sight in synchronized bre mindful breathing, aware of our separate lives as the storms pass by, as the sun sets pink, realizing we are in our different boats yet there for each other, while we row forward towards what is waiting and not knowing, but as we row in separate boats, we are still side by side. Five years into my Massachusetts life, I learned to say brook instead of creek. For these channels full of rain and snowmelt falling over themselves pell-mell down towards the Atlantic. By now, when we cross our big river, the Merrimack, I feel my spirit settling the whole watershed, taking its shape. Fingers reach along hillsides. I trace these sweet, familiar brooks, threading through crumbled granite, carrying the taste of birch and the carol of thrushes lifting with each rain. Thank you. On Preston Beach, where I walked its length from end to end, my mind was busy with many things. And though I tried to listen to the sea, to the crush of sand beneath my boots, and to the songs of the seabirds, Many thoughts intruded upon that quiet place. 
but the air was cold and crisp, and I was glad to be there. Then, as I came to the rocks at the far end, I stopped and turned to begin making my way back the way I had come. I had not been aware of the wind that had been at my back on the way down. Now that same wind that had got, gone unnoticed was whipping into my eyes, making them water and sting with cold, clean, fresh air. I stuck closer to the water's edge on my return, and once or twice when I was not paying attention, my boots got wet right through to my toes. I stepped on rocks covered with green, goldeny seaweed plants. And more than once I slipped, almost falling face first onto the wet sand. The tide was ebbing. The beach was wide and vast. And where the sand was flat between the rocky places, I could see at that acute angle the soft glistening of water glass on its surface. The purple sky, wide and high, was reflected on the surface of the sand. Sky above, sky below. I walked carefully, afraid of cracking its delicate surface beneath my heavy boots. Thank you.